go to think. Okay, and then, wow, for one of the shortest talks. Now, I'm going to give you an idea by just randomly opening this. And can you write the title of the book? Yes. Everybody refers to it as RFM. for remarks on the foundations of math. And I think it's published in the 40s. Uh, Wittgenstein had a, Wittgenstein didn't end up in math initially. It was always had a mathematical flavor, but one book that he wrote when he was very young, he totally repudiated. It was called the Tractatus. I spell that right. It was an attempt, in a much more concise way, to do what Russell did, Whitehead and Russell, make a foundation for all of math actually all of reality. And then he totally repudiated that when he got older. And there's some people <laughs> still who swear by that and haven't made the transition. And one of the most interesting books I've ever, I like the format. This is the title of the book. And what it consists of is there were a whole bunch of little slips of paper in his drawer when he died, and he took all those and put them in a book. Satchel. That means little pieces of paper. And that's, that's a very interesting read. There's no plot here at all. There's, there's no plot here either. I mean, you're not going to find him developing an idea like other philosophers do. And I think it's amazing that somebody could write stuff like this and still be very high up in the philosophical world and be very respected by philosophers and some mathematicians. I said something about John Addison, and I didn't finish my thought about John, about John Addison at Berkeley. I said, what is this thing about sentencing I'm approvable, you know? I said, I said, can't you have two or three sentences talking to each other? Same thing to each other. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a book about whole communities of sentences talking to each other, yes. Didn't face him. I didn't write down what they were. I didn't try to read them. But it was interesting that he said that. So yeah, yeah, people have written papers about whole communities of sentences to start talking to each other. OK. Uh, if I call a proof, a model, a picture, then I must also be able to say this of a Russellian primitive proposition as the egg cell of a proof. That's not so interesting. I wish I could. The part about being like small children having to be lulled to sleep, I thought was one of the funniest things I've heard philosophers say. Say, you worry about inconsistency, but it's a big deal. You know, just relax. Good. Don't, don't worry about it so much. Um, Says, now, one can, now, can it be said that the concepts which mathematician, which mathematics produces are conveniences that essentially we could do without them? Says, first and foremost, the adoption of these concepts expresses the sure expectations of certain experience. We do not accept, for example, a multiplication not yielding the same result every time. I just read you something about that, right? Like, is it the hysterical uh, feelings of a university person? Like, he thinks that's how they react to it. You know, it's inconsistent. And if you don't have a proof of consistency, can't you still deal with it? Sure. You can't prove arithmetic is consistent. You don't have a consistency. Of that within the system, but you still use it. 
So if you don't need to have that share, that, that's the share. Well, I'll let you look at those yourself. I wanted to end early anyway. And uh, my son just had his wheelchair back today, being fixed after six months. He's so happy today. I want to go see that now. Now, do you have any questions? Can I talk to you all? Sure. sure. Uh, I just want to use this opportunity to introduce you. Talk. Talk questions. Any questions? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that at some point, why are the theory? The cartridges, with I think the IOTA operator or something, the unique X, such as blah, 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 Absolutely. which then turned out to be inconsistent. And what happened is that people gave up and then no one uses them. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. So that's, that's, what, that's what would happen if uh, whatever uh, any, any of the uh, formalisms that we use now which was proved to be inconsistent. The reason think... that people go, the reason, for example, I should mention trade. There are lots of things that people go on believing even though they cannot prove it. For instance, I'm talking to you because among other things I believe that you exist, although I cannot prove that. But I believe it. In the same way, I, I think most mathematicians believe that the usual formalisms that we work with are consistent. Okay. Although we cannot we know that we cannot prove it. That's right. But we go on one of the reasons why we go on working with it is that we believe they are consistent. Absolutely, that's true. But and that's true about quite too, yes. And Fraker, I think, had a, a hole in his as well. That's who Victor Stein was talking about first with Fraker. But uh, let me continue on with this idea of Platonism because uh, Victor Stein was not a Platonist. Nobody, people have tried to classify them all these different ways and they're finitist you know, and they don't fit. He doesn't really adhere to any particular religion in that way. But there's some thoughts recently that I've been reading about, about Platonism, very, very confusing. For example, Platonism means that you believe in an external mathematical reality. How do you communicate, you being a real person, with something abstract, an abstract idea? How can that happen? You're real. Math is abstract. In what sense are you actually <laughs> dealing extra, with that? Abstract doesn't mean external. External to what? I don't know what you mean by external in this context. You mean you don't know what I'm talking? Okay, I, I haven't know what defined you mean by what I mean. What do you think? Like words, what? words are abstract things. Okay, are okay. abstract entities. They are not concrete sequences of letters. They are okay. an, an abstraction that we made from. Uh, certain sequences of utterances and so right, on. Right, right. But they are not external. Well, what, that well, if I'm trying to explain to somebody what a Platonist is, in other words, Platonists believe that you discover math. Right. That's Platonism. Yes. Sure. Yes. If you're not a well, Platonist, if you're not a Platonist, Wittgenstein believes you invented invent it. everything. You don't discover it. Yeah, it's really one plus one equals two. Yeah. So it's only a social construct. Well, the one plus one equals two so comes about. In different galaxy, one plus one is not a social construct. <laughs> if, if everybody doesn't get two when they add one plus one, then that's, that shows the experiment comes out the other way. But I'm trying to talk about this, that if you believe you discover math, it's already there, outside of you. And every no one thinks that the number one is concrete. You think all the math is abstract pretty much, right? Yeah, that has so nothing to do with being external to a world. Well, how do you communicate? How does a real being communicate with an abstract mathematical idea? Well, we do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And it's, it, well, it's, it's, well, sort of a, it's a funny way to think about it. I can know that I, I can know that there is a table here. I can I, I discover that there is right. a table in the other room. I don't have to communicate. With I, I think the idea is more: if if all life in the universe ended tomorrow, would one plus one still equal two? Huh? <laughs> if all life in the universe ended tomorrow, 
Because the universe ended tomorrow. Would one plus one still equal two? Sure. No. <laughs> I, I think mathematics is created and by people. And it was uh, one plus one was equal to two before uh, at the time of the dinosaurs. That, and so that's the sort of that's pointless because view. Because, because it's, ex it's external to, to your reality. It's external the, to your beliefs. That's beliefs. It's external external to your of abstract objects. Does not uh, uh, does not have an existence in time. Things exist or don't exist, and and that's the the Platonist stance. That's what it means to be sort of external right. to, to our existence. You'd have to believe these things exist outside of people. But if if mathematics is a social activity, which I don't think anybody would really argue against if you think about it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you have a hard time doing Platonism. It's it just a social activity. So Wittgenstein did agree. With Gödel, he did not. Now he said that Gödel didn't understand what he was proved that he that so part he of his theorem was a metaphysical statement. It wasn't a, a so he a mathematical statement. It was he objected to the extra oh, because baggage that but he was a Platonist, and he disagreed with. Yeah, oh, Gödel was a strong Platonist. In fact, so he stronger than anybody you might imagine. Stronger than Hilbert. All these of you. Very, very Platonist. Gödel was, and, and made no bones about it. But I, I think. By the way, he also proved the existence of God. Who? Uh, Gödel. Gödel is. Yeah. Yeah. In his old age. Yeah. In fact, he's, he's <laughs> looking around for yeah. things to prove. Well. Um, all I can say is if you, you, you won't be bored with, and if you ever pick up something by girl, by girl, by Wittgenstein, you won't be bored. He's, uh, it, I've never seen anybody so fundamental. I mean, the, the idea of what does it mean to follow a rule? You've got to have some ascent, you have to have a trainer, you have to have somebody being trained to add or multiply. All right. Thank you.